So thank you all for spending this beautiful afternoon here in this auditorium talking about typefaces. So today we're going to look at a bunch of typefaces in progress and just talk about the ideas behind them, how they can be improved, and uh, we will start with, and I have to apologize in advance for my American pronunciation of your names, um, Alexander Lubovenko. So thanks for sending this. This is Lorem. And this is a somewhat soft humanist sans. If we look closer, we see we've got nice soft endings. There's some calligraphy in here. I think I feel something of the brush. What's this typeface designed for? How do you envision people using this? Книги, журналы. В основном я думаю, что это больше книги. Books. Books. Mainly books. So for the the text, for the covers, what what size? Yes, text text. Okay. But you've got these beautiful swashes. So maybe the covers also. Это display display. Okay, so it's one family that works for books from all sizes, from text to display. Say yes. Yes? <laughs> so, I think the spacing is mostly very, very good here. It is a very even texture. And as you look across, the word shapes are very even. There are a few specific things that you might want to take another look at. Let me look at, I, I assume you haven't done kerning for this between individual letters yet? Yet, uh, no, no. Okay. So, things like the lowercase e often feels very close to whatever letter is coming after it. So you might want to take a look at the lowercase e again and see if the right side might, not, might need to be a little bit more open. Now, looking at the Cyrillic, the spacing looks a little bit tighter here overall than it does in the Latin. This feels a little bit looser, a little bit more air. In the Cyrillic, Maybe it's the straight strokes. They feel a little bit closer together. So you might want to spend a little bit of time experimenting with tracking. And you can do this in InDesign. Just add tracking two, four, six, eight, and print it out and look at these next to each other and see which one feels the most natural and the most even to you. I wonder, looking at these swashes, if perhaps the family needs to split. So you have one version for text that would have looser spacing and is more comfortable at 10 point, 9 point in the text of a book. And then you have a display version for larger sizes where the spacing is tighter. And some of these details, for example, on the bottom of the lowercase g, that's a very conservative detail, and it's, it's a very short gesture. So it feels a little bit strange with these very long, elegant, flowing gestures of the swashes. So perhaps if you had a display version that was a separate typeface, you could take that opportunity and not compromise characters like the lowercase g so that they'll work in text and allow them to really do everything they would need to do for display maybe make the descenders a little bit longer, play up the elegance of this typeface because it does have what I think is a very elegant skeleton. I also wonder about these loops as a very tight and round shape. When everything else 
is very, it, it's not such a circular shape. Everything else has a real, a real flow to it. And this is a very small, tight shape. So perhaps these loops, and maybe it needs to be just a more closed up change of direction, or maybe it needs to be a larger loop that has a bit more gesture in it, a bit more personality. Looking at these characters, the similar parts are very similar. It has a very cohesive feeling to it. When I see the individual letters, there's none that really stand out to me as a surprise. Um, for example, often a lowercase g, if you see it in isolation, you're surprised when you see the rest of the letters that go with it. But here, the logic seems very well thought out and very cohesive. And that carries through in the Cyrillic as well. I wonder if the top of the bay might be slightly heavy. As I look at this as a whole, that definitely stands out as the heaviest stroke on this page. And one general comment that I would want to make to everybody, it's, uh, it gets a little bit disorienting when you go through a proof and things are different point sizes from one page to the next. So because, for example, the lowercase here is set at a larger point size than the capitals, it's difficult to tell if the weight is truly compatible between these. Because flipping back and forth between them now, I get the feeling that the lowercase is heavier than the uppercase, which isn't actually the case. It's just that they're two different sizes. So when you're making proofs, I would definitely suggest keeping everything at the same size, even if you have to make the lowercase a bit smaller so it can match the size of the caps. In the italic, you know, because you do have these, these lovely swash characters and some real flowing gestures, um, I think that, that these are successful enough that I would start thinking about what other characters you could do this to. And I think one of the challenges of making these swash capitals is going to be making them different enough from one another to have enough visual variety while keeping them cohesive. So right now, you do have some nice differences set up. This, the bottom of this R is a very different shape from the top of this V and the top of the N. And so you've already got a nice variety of shapes to work within. So I think what you'll need to do is figure out the limits of how, how big and how small, sort of how, how loose and how tight these curves can get, and experiment with that system. Are we at eight minutes? OK. With the L, I feel like you have a missed opportunity because you know, the top, this is just a flat stroke. But that shows the limits of, of looking at characters in isolation. The L is not so interesting when I see it all by itself. But when I see it here in the word lorem, it works perfectly as part of a word. So definitely keep thinking of these swashes the same way, not as letters in isolation, but letters that will be parts of words. This, again, I think is, is very successful, just some, some minor weight issues. Maybe the bottom stroke here is a bit heavy. This might be a bit heavy. I do wonder, overall, if your, your italic is slightly too structured and it needs a little more organic quality to it. It does end up with a very a very, very even texture and tone. And perhaps it could have a little more life in it. It's a very quiet italic, but effective for books. 
So we're just about out of time, so do you have any questions for me? Anything you're not feeling confident about in the typeface? Anything you're, you're wondering? No? Totally happy? Do you, do you plan more weights? Yes. Uh, yes. How many? <laughs> uh, bold and uh, black, maybe. Okay. What about light? Light. No? I, I don't see. Good. I'm not sure I'm going to do that. All right. I don't think the light will be required. It will, like it will be needed. Possibly if you do the separate display version, but um, yes, I think your, your instinct is probably right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Andrei Belonokov. Okay. So, what is your typeface for? Uh, for what is your Я планировал его использовать вообще в, в любых проектах, которые ну, по умолчанию заменять вообще uh, самые обычные шрифты. He was planned to do it in all projects, and he wants this type to replace all the other ordinary types. Originally, it was a project about default typeface, the typeface which kind of uh, should be said instead of Times, Times New Roman or something. Okay, so general purpose serif typeface. But Times New Roman didn't start out as a default typeface. Times New Roman did start out specifically as a text typeface for a newspaper. And many of the all-purpose typefaces that, that we have um, available to us with the possible exception of Adobe Sans and Adobe Serif, which are more substitution machines than actual typefaces, generally a typeface does have one specific use. Because you know if it works really well for one thing, then it works for one thing and it will probably work for additional things. Looking at this, it, it looks very much like a newspaper typeface to me. The ball terminals, really connect to traditional newspaper typefaces. The serif structure, the simplicity of that feels like a newspaper typeface. The low contrast, the compact proportions, both horizontally and vertically. And the very traditional nature of the Cyrillic lowercase. Really, everything about this is saying newspaper to me. <laughs> It also looks like it's spaced for eight or nine point text. The details are, are quite clean and quite simplified. And In the italic, also very systematic, very simplified, a traditional newspaper looking italic. There's just a handful of characters that uh, mostly in the italic. That step a bit away from this very default kind of feeling. The large bowl on the top of the lowercase k. Oh, your file won't let me put comments in it. 
So I'll just have to circle it with the mouse. The large bowl of the lowercase k definitely draws attention to itself. When you see that in text, as I read across the line, I stop every time there's a k. And I don't think that k looks bad. I think, oh, that k looks interesting. And in a default typeface, you really want to approach it as a reader, first and foremost. Turn off the type designer part of your brain, set text in it, and just read it. And if your eye stops for any reason, either, wow, I drew a really beautiful je, or, oh, that looks a little heavy, or a little big, or a little distracting, or there's an issue with the spacing. Just tune into your eye as a reader and see where it's stopping. And when it stops, try to figure out why. And when I stop on that K, my gut feeling, my first instinct is, it's a nice looking K, but the top of it is a little too big, which gives it a little too much personality, which makes it a little more distinctive than the rest of this lowercase. And also the way on the F, the way these ball terminals curl in so much, it creates these very tight white spaces here and here. And the same thing on the U. And also the, the Latin Y. These tight spaces in between the ball terminal and the, uh, the arch, my eye stops because it's such a tight pinch point. And so you can flatten out those ball terminals or you can uh, and sort of rotate them back around to open up those white spaces. Or you can make the ball terminals slightly smaller. You can make this bowl pulled up a little bit, slightly above the baseline. And in doing so, just remove those pinch points and remove the things that are stopping your eye and follow that idea of this being a default, traditional, very plain typeface. I think the, the day might be leaning a little too much to the left. But I have to say, overall, your italic is really good, and italics are really hard. Is this your first typeface? Text with it. It's a text one, yes. OK, so you have drawn some, some display typefaces before? Because, uh, yeah, I think your, your experience shows this doesn't look like a first typeface. <laughs> so are we close to the time? Oh, OK, good. So we have time to talk about italic capitals. And italic capitals are a really difficult thing to draw. Because the, uh, the straight stroked ones, those are easy. But the, um, the rounds, the curves on the sides of your O and Q are looking a little flat. And the top of the C and the top of the G feel like the curves have been pushed in. So one way that we often compensate for leaning over of characters, especially curved characters, um, because you, you do that with the skew tool. So if you s imagine that you've skewed that 10 degrees, we will then often skew it horizontally, put that in the background, and use that as a guide to figure out how to compensate for the, the leaning over of those curves. Because you end up with a little too much weight down here, not quite enough weight up here, and the, the center of this curve, the, the visual center of it, kind of sagging a bit. So you can push that up by using the skew maybe a third. So if you, if you skew it over 10 degrees, then skew it up 3 degrees. And then you've done something between skewing and rotating which really does a lot of compensation for the strange things that happen to curves when you mechanically distort them. And it looks like you've already done this in your numbers. 
So I would just have another look at the capitals. Now I see a regular, I see an italic, and I see a bold. Where is the bold italic? <laughs> you are going to do one, right? <laughs> Actually, I wasn't planning to. Oh, come on. <laughs> People use bold italic. People need bold italic, and especially a default typeface. If you want it to be very universal, bold italic is a universally wanted thing. That's right, I mean, right. Italic small caps, you can live without. Bold small caps are easy. You could do them, but you can live without them. But bold italic is non-negotiable. You have to have it. I see here that you've, um, you've added quite a bit of tracking to your small caps, so they're really very open. And I'm really happy that you did that. I think uh, not enough type designers do this, and that's, it's something that typographers instinctively do. A lot of graphic designers who are not uh, well-versed in microtypography don't know to do this, so we always try to build some extra spacing in our small capitals like you've done here. I'm very happy to see that you've done that. And overall, I think your spacing is really, really solid. So is there, do you have any, anything you're wondering about? Any last questions for me? Probably not. I need to process what you already said. Okay. <laughs> but Thank very you. nice work. Thank you. So, Azamat Kodzoyev. Um, yeah, I've got it. So, there's Dietrich and Dietrich display. Da. <laughs> what is this typeface for? What would you, how, how do you envision people using it? Общий внешний вид у него такой немного сказочный, нереалистичный, немножко с ощущением старины. И поэтому планировалось использование в крупном текстовом, в каких-то около сказочных. It looks a little bit uh, fairy taleish and old fashioned, so I was yes. planning to use it um, in books uh, related to the fairy tales or something. Now, I have to admit, I'm having a hard time seeing what the difference is between the display and the normal one. Они все еще в процессе. I'm still in a process. Okay. They're still quite the same. Okay, so I'm not losing my mind. <laughs> so I see the lowercase g, lowercase e. Yeah, not, not so much more than that. I think if you are going to push these apart, rather than trying to make the display more crazy, I think it might actually be a good idea to see what you might want to do to the text to make it a little bit quieter. Because I definitely get that fairy tale atmosphere from this. But I think you don't necessarily need to do quite as many things as you're doing to get that fairy tale atmosphere. Uh, for example, the bottom of this queue. This little space right here, 
that's never going to work below 24 point or so. And we use quite a few cues in English. But if, if someone were to use this in Spanish or French, where they have calca this and casca that, it's going to be way too many things like that. And it's, it's going to draw a lot of attention to itself. And it goes back to that idea of seeing where your eye stops. My eye also kept stopping on these diamond forms for the periods, for the dots on the I and J. When you have less of them in the Cyrillic, although in Ukrainian you'll still see a lot of them with the I, so um, it might be worth keeping them as a diamond shape, but experimenting with, do you still get that feeling from it if you round it off a bit? if you just soften it. Because there are so many soft shapes in this typeface. You know, this is blunted off, it's round, it's, it's not sharp at all. Even these serifs, they have sharp endings, but the curves really, really play against that. So with the I and J, I think blunting them off like this isn't quite enough. You might try sort of puffing these curves out to see if, if softening it that way, but leaving the corners helps. It would feel a bit like the serifs. Or really just rounding these corners off a bit and leaving that sort of fundamental diamond shape to it, but just softening it a little bit so it's not so many sharp edges. So one very easy thing to fix here is your word space. I read each word as its own discrete element, and it makes it more difficult to take everything in as a full sentence. I think the, the spacing of the round characters is probably a little bit too tight. The spacing of the straight characters there are some inconsistencies in here. If you look at MI versus NI, the MI feels looser than the NI does. But then BA is very, very tight. And actually, these two words dilate body next to each other. Look at the oceans of space between DIL and then the extremely tight BOD. I think you have... Uh, well, I guess there's no, no lowercase spacing proof. And you have the same issue here in Russian. And this is something that would be fixed by kerning, but the inconsistencies of this and this, those aren't kerning issues. These are not individual pairs. Those are the same shapes, and therefore they should have the same spaces. And that actually makes spacing so much easier. If you just take all the shapes that are the same and numerically give them exactly the same side-bearing values, then you're not thinking every time and using all this mental energy. It's like, well, should this be 44? Should it be 48? Or should it be 52? You decide on one and apply it on all of them. And then everything about the spacing becomes easier after that. And you also have a much easier time, once the spacing is consistent, seeing where your weight issues are and where your proportion issues are. And in some ways, uneven spacing, um, it can fool you into thinking you're closer to being done with the letter forms than you actually are. It obscures a lot of subtle issues and minor problems that are there. And once the spacing is, is worked out and in place, these minor weight issues and proportion issues are suddenly going to be very visible. And once they're visible, they're really easy to fix. 
So unfortunately, it's hard for me to tell right now if there are many weight problems here. And maybe the bottom of this K, for example, is slightly heavy, but because these spaces around it are, are still need to be worked out, it's hard to tell one way or the other. Uh, possibly the S is slightly wide because it has a very horizontal uh, sort of bias to these, these curves. And again, that's hard to tell now, but something to look out for. And in having such a small x height, you do by default get a very different feeling between the Latin and the Cyrillic. So I wonder in the text version if that's something you want to play with, seeing what would happen. Because this, this x height is perfect for a display. It has that fairy tale old fashioned feeling. But for text, it makes the Russian text look very dense with a lot of space between the lines and a very different texture from the, the English. So possibly worth taking another look at. То есть увеличить x height в текстовом. Do I need to increase the size of x height uh, in the text? I think it would be worth doing a couple of test words and just see. Because um, yeah, you can imagine what it would look like. Maybe it would be better, and maybe it wouldn't. But you never really know for sure until you see it. But first and foremost, that was our timer, right? Yeah, first and foremost, work on your spacing. Thanks. All right, thank you. So, Elena Novoselova, you've drawn this lovely bedoni. Uh, I planned to use it for books and magazines. Okay. And um, my italic is pretty rough sketch now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm on the beginning of doing it. I think it might not be as rough as you think it is. <laughs> I think it might not be as rough as you think it is. Because it really is starting to... I can see what your ideas are. And it looks like it's working very well as a system. I mean, sure, there's some spacing issues in the italic that, that one more round of revisions you could work out. But I'm curious to know what, what point size you envision this being used at? Because uh, you sent 14, 16, and 18. So is this sort of uh, like a larger... Oh, I sent... <laughs> I have sent uh, 9 and 10 and... Oh, and here's 8, 10, and 12. Yeah. So, uh, for, for a Bedoni, that's a lot of point sizes to cover in in one. Yes, I just have a <laughs> testing file, so. So when you print it out at these point sizes, which one feels the most natural to you? I think uh, 10, 12, so on. Okay. So if 10 and 12 are the most natural to you, you can stop proofing it at eight point. Uh. <laughs> and you, you might want to look at it at 24 points so you can see your curves a bit better, but or really, if you have a point size in mind, concentrate your proofing on that point size. We'll go back to the beginning quickly. 
Is there a particular Bodoni that you were looking at as your source? Um, I looked through uh, different uh, Bodoni styles and uh, uh, concentrate on text ones. But were you looking at um, like Bodoni's manual, or were you looking at later? I looked uh, it in new book, uh, Badoni book in by Fidon. Oh, it is the manual. Yep. Okay, so that you went straight back to the original source. That's great. Yes. <laughs> what do you think of Badoni's Cyrillics? <laughs> <laughs> it's that. crazy, but uh, there are some interesting things there. Because I have heard from other Russian people that Bedoni's Cyrillics are notoriously terrible. <laughs> <laughs> he had some very specific ideas, but it, I think somebody described it to me as, it was as though someone described Cyrillic to Bedoni over the phone, <laughs> and he said, yeah, 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 I got it. <laughs> yeah, something like this. So I'm very impressed with how you've captured the spirit of Bodoni without making any of his mistakes <laughs> with Cyrillic. <laughs> so here again, I, I want to yes. encourage you to always proof these character sets of the same point size. Um, I think your, your spacing by and large, is, is in good shape. Things are feeling pretty even. Um, the, the spaces look well balanced. I think you're at the point now with this typeface where it's time to start looking at characters in groups and seeing how t you can make uh, specific kinds of things more consistent. For example, I would make a proof with all of the ball terminals. And just find as many words as you can that have these ball terminals in them. So the word crazy has C and R and A and Y. Um, cages, faces, a bunch of words like this. And see how do these ball terminals relate to one another because uh, just as I look at this right now, the F, that feels a little small, the G feels very large, the A seems like it's probably okay, but I'm not sure if it relates well with the C, the C is maybe a little small, and so by looking at these together, you can very quickly see just how to make them consistent, and it's going to be a matter of scaling things up and down, you know, plus or minus 5% in most cases. And also, you know, really look at how the ball terminal relates to the curve. Because right now, you've got a bit of the feeling of we have a stroke that comes down and then it attaches to a ball terminal. And so, this curve on the outside needs just a little bit more finessing so that from here to here, it feels like one continuous thing rather than being a curve that starts here and ends here and attaches to another thing. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. And that, again, is not difficult. It just takes a bit of time and, and really looking closely at what that curve is doing. And there are some minor weight issues here and there. Um, for example, on this G, the weight on these parts of the bowl, the character that feels kind of different from the way this is done. This is a bit squarer, and this one feels a little more sort of deflated on the outside. So that sort of needs to puff up a little more, I think. And also, this part of this entire stroke, the heaviest point is here. But usually, the heaviest point is somewhere in there. So I would just have another look at, at 
where the weight, the main part of the weight is sitting as you go down the curves on this bowl. In the end, you might take another look at the weight from here to here and how it relates to that. Because again, you're getting the heaviest point on that whole curve there as opposed to on the main stem. And these are all little things, but once you work this out, you'll be amazed at how finished it feels. And it's going to be the same process in the italic. You know, looking at these ball terminals, making sure they all relate properly and, and feel like the same size or the correct relative size. And uh, do analyses of existing moderns and just see what are the conventions for the size relationships between ball terminals. And if you don't like what the convention is, then you know that you're doing something different from the convention on purpose because you definitely want to, as opposed to it just sort of happening on its own. So do you have any, uh, anything you're wondering about? No, thank you. You are going to do a bold weight, right? I have it, but I, for some reason I didn't send it. Oh, I would have loved to see the bold weight. Because this, a typeface with contrast like this, my bold is always, the regular is good, but the bold is where it's really, really great. But very nice work. Thank you Thank for, you. Uh, for bringing it. Okay, so we go from the most serif to the most sans serif. Uh, Irina Fursina? Yes, hi. I'm here. Oh, back there. Why are you so far away? <laughs> so, tell me about your typeface. Uh, first, I suppose that it uh, will be used in uh, long text readings, but now I understand that um, it's better to use in short texts, uh, in headings, and titles. Maybe. I think the reason why you might think it's best for short texts is because right now it's spaced very tight. So the spacing, when I look at this, implies to me that this typeface is designed for 24 to 30 points. But the spacing in the Latin and the spacing in the Cyrillic are completely different. This is spaced like a text face. I could see this being at 12 point. So I think the first thing you need to do is reconcile the spacing of your two writing systems. Is there one you prefer over the other? Uh, now I work um, on it and now it's better than so, between the Latin and the Cyrillic, neither is your favorite? The no, Latin one. The Latin one. Okay. So, if the Latin one is your favorite, then you have a display face. <laughs> and you need to make the spacing in the Cyrillic considerably tighter. And, uh, like I told Alexander, uh, probably the best way to do this is to take it into InDesign and do minus 2, minus 4, minus 6, minus 8. Set up a file that has you know, a block of the Latin and a block of the Cyrillic next to each other at exactly the same point size and letting, and just experiment with the uh, leave the Latin alone and experiment with the Cyrillic until they look the same in terms of their general overall spacing. And the nice, the, the great thing about working with tracking in InDesign is that the InDesign tracking units and Robofont glyphs and FontLab spacing units are one to one. So if you've tracked something in by two, you subtract one unit from either side in your side bearings, 
You can do that with a, a very simple script. And what you have done in the font is exactly the same as what you liked on paper. So this has almost a, an inscriptional quality to it. It feels like stone carving. Was that an influence on what you were doing? Uh, yes, it has some influence. Okay, so that, that also implies that it is intended to be a display face. There's a flaring on many of these strokes that, um, well, it's sort of like the Bodoni ball terminals. Now is the time to have a look at the flaring and make sure things are, are fully consistent with it. Uh, for example, what you have going on in the, the caps, really embodied in the A. You can see it a lot in the W. It's a very different feeling from what happens on the crossbar of the F and what happens on many of these terminals in the lower case. You've set up a system where it's sharp but blunt. But these, these terminals on the lower case, they don't have any of that. They're neither sharp nor blunt. They're just very conventional sort of sans serif terminals. And so seeing the, the angle of these next to the S, it creates sort of a visual noise. There's not a real logic to it. It doesn't entirely, when I look at it, I can't tell why it's like that. And on the top of the T, it's a nice shape, but I wonder if it's too pointy. Because there are sharp but blunt things, but there's not truly pointy forms in this. Well, I guess the top of the N, but even the, the A, V, and W, they feel a bit softened and a bit blunted off, and they don't get as, as light and sharp as the top of the T. So maybe have a look at rounding that off a little bit more. And I feel like the bottom strokes on these, the weight is very inconsistent, and they feel a little bit short to me. And they're very different from the ones in the caps, which to my somewhat educated but decidedly non-native eyes. The caps are more successful than what you have in the lower case. I also find this is standing out as a little bit too heavy. And this, the, the bottom axis, uh, the, the center of the bottom bowl is in one place, and the top pole feels a bit too far to the left. So it feels a little bit like it's tipping over. But overall, I think this has a really nice feeling to it. And what else do you have planned for this family? Do you plan uh, italic, additional uh. weights? Uh, Italian cobalt, and for regular one, I plan ligatures. Uh, the, what was the last part? Sorry? What was the last part? Uh, ligatures, ligas. Oh, ligatures, okay. What about small capitals? Mm, I don't think about them. That surprises me, actually. With uh, a typeface that is so uh, monumental in feeling, that feels so inscriptional, you would think small capitals would be a very natural sort of idea. Uh, the one thing about uh, Cyrillic typography, Russian typography, is that because we have 
we usually have a lot of similar shapes and lower cases and upper cases, making the small caps and actually using small caps is not a part of culture. So it's getting more and more common to okay. use them. So basically graphic designers, they don't know what to do with them. So you're <laughs> drawing them and nobody using them. So it's one thing. But the other thing is that when you have a typeface with a so huge, I would say, uppercases, probably it's a good idea to make the small caps. That's exactly what I was thinking. It's this relationship. There's a big, big difference between your caps and your lowercase. So if you had small caps, they definitely wouldn't match the size of the lowercase. I would picture them being you know, somewhere, somewhere up here. So it becomes not something to use in text, but another option for display. So rather than having something big, loud, all caps, you could have this nice large, but not as large, small caps. I could picture it looking really great on a book cover. Do you have any, uh, any last questions? Anything else you're no, wondering thanks. about? OK. Thank you very much. OK, so we have our next Irina. <laughs> Irina Smirnova. So, tell me about your typeface. Well, um, this is a typeface for text, for long reading. And, um, mm, yeah, it's the type family for books. What else? Maybe you have a question. Um, so where, this is going to sound like a strange question, but where do these shapes come from? Do they come from calligraphy, or do they come from drawing, or do they come from a historical source? Well, they come from both, from calligraphy and some historical influence. And um, there was clearly some uh, influence from uh, French uh, Renaissance. And, uh, yes, especially in the uh, italic. Um, well, uh, what, what? So I, I ask because the feeling of the Latin and the Cyrillic are so completely different. This uh, feels much more florid, organic. Um, there are so many terminals very soft, modeled terminals. And um, I just don't see as much of this in the, in the Latin. So they end up with a completely different feeling. So the Latin and Cyrillic have different feeling? To me, they do. OK. So even when I look at the, the, the A and the R, I mean, this, this doesn't, they're pretty calm. But then looking in here, the, the leg of the ya and, and uh, L, and especially the K and the J, they just have so much organic, organicness. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, how can you bring more of this feeling into the Latin? Because the Latin feels so calm and so structured, and the Cyrillic feels so organic and so written. Oh, well, maybe I overdone it, because I wanted to balance uh, Latin and Cyrillic. And um, uh, for me, uh, Latin naturally feels more... more soft and round, 
and I wanted to bring the same roundness and softness and the feeling of the calligraphy into Cyrillic. That's a really interesting idea. But I think, I think I understand what the problem might be. So in the Latin, the softness is mainly in the, the underlying skeleton. It's the structure, the inherent structure of the characters themselves. So in the Cyrillic, you've tried to add this softness, but it's through details. And so it's terminals, and it's the shapes of some forms, but the, the underlying structure can't really change. And so the softness is coming from two completely different places. Okay, I see. And so I wonder what you could do to the details in the Latin, just to make them a little bit more soft, a little bit more florid, so that it starts to feel more like what you have in the Cyrillic. Because mm. I think they, they're both nice typefaces, but right now they're, they're more like cousins, and they're not so much like siblings. Okay. And do you have any italic? Well, uh, this is just, just a sketch to see how they relate to each other, uh, because okay. I started to redesign italic at some point. Because I would be very curious to see the relationship between the Latin and Cyrillic italics. That might help bridge that gap a little bit. Okay. But yeah, there's so many nice, nice details and things going on here that you see how this feels much more conservative. At least to me, it feels more conservative. Yeah. Well that's a very interesting insight. And so, I mean, if we think about details that, that the, the Latin doesn't really have, or that, that the Latin has that the Cyrillic doesn't really have, it's all of these head serifs. I wonder if there's something softer that you could do with these as one possible idea. Or playing a bit more with, with things like this. I mean, the fact that the S is so conservative and pointy and, and a very conventional structure, I think that's an opportunity for softness that you could bring in. And the R also, a little more curl, a little more weight, something a bit more organic and, and less just polite about it, I think might be helpful. And the G, I feel like you're missing some sort of opportunity here. Because again, this could be soft, but right now it's pointy. And this is such a polite, flat shape. Maybe there could be a bit more, a bit more curve, a bit more casualness, a bit more finesse through that spine. And one last place you could try is the, the bottom of the D and the U. You're starting to go in the direction of them being a bit softer than the other serifs, but they could go softer still, I think, and have a bit more of the feeling of, of some of these shapes. So do you, do you have anything else that you're wondering about, not entirely confident about in, in this typeface right now? Yeah, I was wondering if uh, you see Latin being close to some historical styles or references, because I'm a bit uh, confused with the background of this typeface. Uh, and, uh... Um, in terms of typefaces, I don't really, I'm not really seeing a lot of specific type references in this. Okay. Uh, I see a, a, some Aldine, Bembo. Um, in the proportions, the proportions definitely feel like those, those book typefaces from the era of Aldus Minutius. Um, but in the, in the way the serifs are, it's much more of an earlier thing, the Venetian incunabula. And so perhaps um, 
actually, perhaps looking at what the Phoenicians did would help you, because they had a certain looseness to the way, um, just the way their typefaces feel on the page. So that, that might be a helpful thing. But then the A, I like the A, but it does feel a bit different from everything else. The A, I'm really seeing the influence of Quadrat and Fred Schmeier's. And so this brings us much more into the uh, 16th century punch cutter world. So um, yeah, as we sort of start to take this apart, I definitely am seeing different influences from different eras across the, the whole lowercase. And um, perhaps picking one and, and you know, looking at this, I, I really get that Venetian incunabula, you know, Jensen and his contemporaries. I get that feel from it. Okay. So maybe that's a place to start. And uh, yeah, I see that in the caps as well. They have definitely that calligraphy, not, not the bembo proportions at all, but the Venetian calligraphic proportions. So have a look at that and see, see where it takes you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.